Come in, if you dare. Welcome to a world of the fantastic and the macabre. Welcome to Ghost Stories YYC. Prepare yourself for a tale of terror. Written by Jimmy Monkaspenny. With art by Jimmy Monkaspenny. The Ballad of Two Sheds Jim. On a dark and foreboding Tuesday afternoon, in the quiet town of Littlehampton, Norman Rothwell lurked behind his net curtains, surreptitiously observing the residents of Beaconsfield Road's daily movements through his battered old bird-watching binoculars while recording their activities in a well-worn ledger. It was from this vantage point that he had discovered the juicy affair between Brian Baxter from number 71 and Mrs. O'Leary at number 57. Mr. O'Leary was a truck driver, often away for days at a time, and Brian's wife Cheryl went to yoga every Monday and Thursday at 3 p.m. When both unwitting spouses were away, tea and scones were taken furtively into the upstairs spare bedroom at number 57 with window and curtains firmly closed. So far this afternoon, Norman's ledger contained new entries regarding Stevie Hunt, the terrible teen from number 28 riding that confounded skateboard, scrawling rude words on the local bus shelters and lampposts. Also, Joe Fisher, who lived around the corner in North Street, but enjoyed letting his evil-looking pit bull princess do her business on the fresh paving slabs of Beaconsfield Street. There were special notations in red ink to contact the bylaw regarding these. But Norman's true target, his nemesis, the object of his obsession, was his mysterious and sinister neighbor known locally as Two Sheds Jim. Even the dastardly man's moniker was an irritating incongruity that caused his left eye to twitch uncontrollably. Why two sheds, for the sake of the Lord's bicycle, when the creepy bugger only had one? Like clockwork, his target appeared around the corner at 15.53 p.m., returning from his habitual half-pint of Guinness at the Dew Drop pub. To the casual observer, there was nothing remarkable or particularly interesting about Two Sheds Jim. His face was as dull and expressionless as his clothing. Yet, if you got too close in proximity, a wave of cold dread would invade your armpits and bowels, causing a sudden desire to simultaneously flee and curl into a ball. Most locals would quickly cross to the other side of the road if they saw him coming, and the dewdrop was always deserted in the early afternoon. Even the hardened alcoholics traveled far and wide for sustenance. Upon his return to number 44, two sheds would bypass the house completely, making his way round back, picking his way through the overgrown grass, dandelions, thistles and nettles that comprised a cesspool of a garden, and enter the single ramshackle garden shed leaning against the back fence where the nefarious villain spent hours often long into the night banging and clanging away, strange odors and eerie lights emanating from the cracks in the door and walls. These mysterious activities were Norman's great mystery, his holy grail, a compulsive fascination of manic proportions that invaded his every waking moment, preventing any semblance of restful sleep. In the three years since that terrible, momentous day when Two Sheds moved into number 44, Norman had grown steadily more pale and gaunt. Eye bags had grown off his eye bags, hanging lower and darker on his face as he constantly speculated in his ledger regarding the shed-related activities. Was he a terrorist building a bomb? An inventor building a weaponized exoskeleton? A mad scientist creating a mobile death ray? Norman fought down acidic bile as he moved furtively to a rear-facing window and settled into a threadbare armchair. He tightly gripped his ledger and binoculars in white knuckles, eyes fixed unblinkingly on the door of the shed, lips thin with determination, for tonight was the night. His tortured mind had finally cracked, and despite his fear, he would confront his terrible neighbor solve this confounded mystery, and hopefully discover enough evidence of wrongdoing to make this all go far, 
far away, and allow life to return to a delightful, dull normality. He sat there, waiting for the cover of darkness, head full of glorious dreams of blue flashing lights, steel handcuffs, trials, long prison sentences, medals, and newspaper interviews. The sun was fully set by 8.40 p.m. Dressed in dark clothing, armed with a trusty flashlight and an old iron poker from the living room fireplace, Norman crept down to the garden. He scaled the fence and tiptoed up to the shed, a faint glow emanating from within. Ever so slowly, he pulled the door open, cringing as the rusted hinges protested. He peered within. The garden shed contained the usual collection of garden tools, rakes, spades, shears, and hammers hanging off wall hooks. An old, dusty workbench sat along one wall covered in yellow newspaper and assorted nails, nuts, and bolts. Judging from the impressive quantity of cobwebs, nothing had been disturbed for quite some time. There was also an extremely puzzling absence of any villain and a well-worn path through the floor dust that led directly to a second door at the far end of the shed that stood slightly ajar. From it came a soft light pulsing from blue to yellow in time to a muffled banging of metal on metal. Norman scratched his head in bewilderment as the door obviously seemed to lead somewhere. And yet on the outside of the small rickety shed, there was in fact no door to be found. A deep chill settled in Norman's chest, as though a ghostly fist was closing around his heart. And yet he was drawn irresistibly towards this mysterious door. His feet stepping woodenly forward of their own accord, like he were a puppet on someone else's strings. Dreamlike, he observed himself opening the door and stepping through. Inside was another, bigger, shed, cluttered floor to ceiling with workbenches, strange equipment, and racks of tools, electronics, components, circuit boards, and wiring. Along one side was an elaborate chemistry set with dripping pipettes, glass tubing, and vials full of multi-hued liquids, some smoking and some glowing in the dim lighting. Opposite the laboratory was a dark stone altar adorned with skulls, both animal and human, candles and strange evil symbols that were hard to look at, drawn in blood. Across the room, at the far end, stood the hunched figure of Two Sheds Jim in front of a wall of satellite dishes pointed in various directions, his hand grasping a large lever. He was peering intently at what appeared to be a collection of images tattooed on a large piece of preserved human back skin. Norman stepped forward unsteadily fighting the urge to vomit. The floor seemed to be tilting slowly from side to side as though they were aboard a large sea vessel. His clammy fingers clutched the iron poker for comfort as two sheds heaved down the lever and turned towards him, the walls humming as though large gears were turning and groaning nearby. The cold, expressionless face of his neighbor seemed stuck permanently in a vacant leer, eerily lit by a multitude of flashing red lights from all around them. Ah, there, there you, you are, Norman. Norman. I, I wasn't, wasn't sure, sure you, you would, would make, make it. it, hissed the cold, monotonous voice of Two Sheds Jim. His tone chilled Norman further, causing him to shiver despite a moment of brief warmth as his bladder failed. A distant part of his brain registered that Two Shed's lips did not move when he spoke. You are most welcome to my shed within a shed, dearest neighbor. While I normally cannot tolerate the presence of humans, I have finally completed my great work, and a witness to my labors is fitting, I believe. Take a seat, hissed the eerie being, the last statement more of a command than a suggestion. Norman damply collapsed onto a nearby stool as his head swam and the room undulated around him. What? was all he managed to stammer out. What, what am, am I doing, doing here? here? What, what have, have I, I rather fabulously, fabulously accomplished over many hours, days, and, and years of hard, studious, studious labor, 
while you peered from your window and scribbled in your spy diary, like the insignificant, pathetic vermin you are? Norman could only nod, dully, stunned and stupefied. I was sent here from a place, far away, yet very close. Were you to visit such a realm, your feeble mind would be destroyed. Your brain would dissolve into slush and dribble from your facial orifices. I was summoned here, employed, you might say, to cure this planetary orb of the viral organism known as humanity. Your filthy race is fascinated by apocalypse mythology. It is prevalent in every land, every culture. Apocalypse legends permeate your subconscious, your very DNA, because it is your purpose, the ultimate reason for your existence. Indeed, here you can see various methods of world-ending events preserved for posterity in the human skin of Bob, the not-so-famous younger brother of Nostradamus himself. He gestured at the grotesque piece of tattooed skin that had been cut from Nostradamus' brother, hopefully once deceased. From a certain point of view, it could be argued that I am assisting you in your ultimate goal, pushing humanity towards Nirvana, as prophesized. W what are you? Norman managed to squeak, fighting a laconic compulsion to submit. I'm just a technician, an architect of destruction, if you like, a perfectionist of annihilation. Here, in my shed within a shed, which exists in a pocket dimension safe from the repercussions of my work, I have been constructing all of humanity's collected apocalyptical fantasies made real. The ultimate apocalypse anthology, if you'd like. Usually, I have to get creative, but your race has provided me with a fabulous itinerary of imaginative destruction, and I am merely following your own recipe, fulfilling your destiny, you might say. Two Shed's Jim seemed to find this rather amusing, and indulge in some authentic mad scientist cackling at this point. From somewhere deep inside, Norman summoned his last vestiges of courage to rise unsteadily to his feet, gripping his poker of iron, and wield it with righteous anger upon this creature of unspeakable evil, to stop him before it was too late and save his world. This last, Desperate attempt at defiance merely caused Two Shed's Jim to laugh even louder. You cannot stop me, foolish insect. It has already happened. I set this all in motion before you entered. Your time is over. It is done. Norman felt a vast roaring heat through the open door behind him, and heard a multitude of harmonized screaming as Two Shed's Jim removed his mask of dead flesh to reveal his true face. Norman's screams joined those of all humanity, including yours.